The question of why a mother would choose to hurt her child is one that I don't think we will ever have an answer to, whether it be postpartum psychosis or because the mother is stressed and overwhelmed. Those are frequently the reasons people will give. But in cases like this one, we don't have those answers. Instead, it appears that this mother simply grew tired of having a child and decided to take her life away from her to make her life easier. Not only that, but she won't even admit that she was the one who did it. But before we get into this tragic, horrific case, I want to take a moment to say a huge thank you to Raycon for partnering with me on today's video. Raycon offers products that deliver premium audio at the perfect price point so you can tune out all the noise and tune into something great. I like that Raycon now provides affordable tech that actually performs with amazing sound quality. They literally cost half the price of other earbuds and perform just as well, if not better. That allows me to have multiple pairs in case I do lose a set, which I have actually recently done, but it's okay because I had my extra. I personally use my Raycons pretty much every single day when I'm working out and lifting and listening to music. I also use them for listening to podcasts while I'm doing cardio or doing chores around the house. Raycon also has an amazing battery life, offering 8 hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life, so no matter what I'm doing, I know they'll last. One of my favorite things about Raycon's everyday earbuds is their gel tips that give you a custom comfortable fit that will stay in your ears no matter what. A quick funny story is that a few months ago, I did my very first circus show, and me and one of my friends spent day in and day out training on our apparatuses in the air, doing our flips and tricks while having to listen to our music while we practice. Obviously, we can't have the music playing over a speaker because there's a lot of different people practicing at once, so we had to have our headphones in. No matter what I did in the air, no matter how many times I dropped or spun, my Raycons stayed solid. Meanwhile, my friend's earbuds were constantly falling out. I actually ended up lending her a pair of my Raycons so that she could practice her performance without her earbuds falling out. After the show, she ended up buying herself a pair because she loved them so much. I also got my roommate on Raycons. He's literally constantly wearing them around the house. So even if you already have a pair, they make the best gifts for friends and family. The other feature I love is their noise isolation versus awareness mode. The noise isolation feature allows you to be totally immersed in your music and block out all outside noise, which is nice when I just want to be dialed in while doing my cardio on the stair stepper or running on the treadmill, but they also have awareness mode for when I'm listening to something while on the go. For example, when I take my dog on a long walk around the neighborhood, I want to be aware of my surroundings at all times. So, awareness mode allows me to listen to my podcasts while also being aware of what's going on around me. I know you'll love your Raycons just as much as I love mine, so go ahead and give them a try out for yourself. Click the link in the description box below or head to buyraycon.com slash RSTC for 20% off plus free shipping. Thank you again so much to Raycon for partnering with me on today's video. One more thing before we get into the video, I do want to apologize in advance for my voice. It kind of sounds scratchy, but it also feels very effortful to talk, and I feel like that's because my throat is really dry. I think I'm probably getting sick. I sound a little bit stuffy as well, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but if it gets extra scratchy near the end of the video, I do apologize in advance. I might be getting sick for like the fifth time in the past year, which is really, really, really annoying, but it is what it is. That's what happens when you work in pediatrics, I guess. But anyways, with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we will be discussing the tragic murder of Charlotte Napertali. Charlotte Napertali was born on October 21st, 2016 to her mother, Jenea Pratt and Ramir Talley. At the time, 17-month-old Charlotte was living with her mother in East Hills, Pennsylvania. Not a lot is known about the relationship between Jenea and Ramir or how involved Ramir was in Charlotte's life. But unfortunately, in December of 2019, 24-year-old Ramir was killed in an officer-involved shooting. In this case, 911 received a call to report that Ramir was threatening another man with a gun. When police arrived, Ramir ran. There was a chase, but as Ramir was running away, he attempted to shoot at police, prompting the police to return fire, killing him. 
So this definitely was an unfortunate situation, but it does sort of give us some insight into who Charlotte's father was. At the time, 24-year-old Jenea was dating a man named Albert Williams. Meanwhile, she was also taking classes at CCAC Homewood, a community college to work towards an associate degree. Obviously, taking classes and being a mother is hard, so sometimes Charlotte would be left with Albert to watch her. This is what happened on April 5th, 2018. According to later reports, Jenea had classes that day, and while she was gone, Albert was watching Charlotte. That afternoon, he gave her some fish sticks for lunch and gave her some juice in her pink sippy cup. After lunch, at around noon, Albert and Charlotte left home to go and pick Jenea up from school. After picking her up, the three of them made a few stops before returning home at around 1.30 to 2 p.m. At that time, Albert left the home, but he came back only a few minutes later because he realized that Jenea's phone was still in his car. He came back to return the phone, and at that time, he also dropped off some marijuana for Jenea to smoke when she felt like it. Once settled in at home, Jenea and Charlotte sat on the couch together and relaxed until Charlotte ultimately fell asleep. At that time, Jenea moved Charlotte to her bed where she laid her down with her sippy cup. For the next hour, a friend came over and smoked some weed with Jenea before leaving again. After that, after that hour of smoking, Jenea got back up to check on Charlotte. But it was at that time that Jenea realized that something was horribly wrong. She realized that Charlotte's lips looked blue and she wasn't breathing, so she immediately called 911 to report that her daughter was unresponsive. When police arrived, they walked into the home and were immediately hit with the smell of marijuana. They then found baby Charlotte, who was lying face up in her bed, unconscious. Her lips were blue, her skin was cold to the touch, and there was no pulse. Police also observed that there was what looked to be a small amount of blood coming out of her mouth and nose. Of course, first responders attempted life-saving measures to try and bring this baby girl back. As they tried CPR, a thick red liquid started to come out of Charlotte's mouth, which may have been what was blocking her breathing. At this time, Nobody had absolutely any idea what could have happened. One moment, Charlotte was alive and happy. She went down for a nap, and the next moment, she was unresponsive. While first responders were attempting to save Charlotte's life, they heard as Jenea became absolutely irate. She exclaimed that if her daughter was choking, she would have cleared her mouth, and she kept yelling, this isn't my fault, this can't be my fault, and I can't get in trouble for this. While providing CPR, they had also cleared off the coffee table and in the commotion of moving her body and doing chest compressions, the officers broke the coffee table. That also made Jenea absolutely furious. She was very upset that they broke her beloved coffee table while trying to save Charlotte's life. After beginning CPR, Charlotte was then rushed to the nearest children's hospital where medical staff continued to work tirelessly to save her life. But after just an hour at that hospital, 17-month-old little Charlotte passed away. As this was going on, of course, police wanted to speak with Jenea to figure out what was going on. What could have caused this baby to go unconscious? Did she choke on something? Did she get into something dangerous without her mom's knowledge? Maybe she accidentally swallowed a battery or something else that can happen if a child isn't being watched closely. Things like this are unfortunate, but it can happen with even the most attentive parents. There was no obvious sign of trauma to Charlotte, so it's not like there was any clear signs of abuse. This seemed totally and completely out of the blue. But Jenea was not having any of police's questioning. According to hospital staff, she was uncooperative, hostile, and combative at the hospital. When detectives tried speaking with her, she stormed out of the hospital and started walking down the street, making it a third of a mile away before finally being stopped by an officer. Once they spoke with her, she expressed frustration that she was being treated like a criminal while her daughter was fighting for her life. This feeling is definitely understandable to a degree, but I feel like her behavior was very concerning to officers because most mothers would want to be by their child's side even in the moments after their death. 
most mothers wouldn't initially be worried about looking like a criminal. Most mothers' first concern would be the well-being of their child. They would be the ones trying to figure out what happened. They would be talking to the police and asking questions not running away from them. After Charlotte's sudden and tragic death, police started their investigation into what was really going on here. By the following day, April 6th, police executed a search warrant at the home where Charlotte first went unresponsive. Some of the evidence recovered from the scene included nighttime cold medicine, children's pain reliever, a small grape children's drink, a yellow sippy cup, a cigar wrapper containing marijuana, a marijuana grinder, and a pink sippy cup, which was found in Charlotte's bed. Now, while executing the search warrant, I want to note that Jenea was home, and when police went into Charlotte's bedroom to recover that sippy cup, Jenea was once again very volatile and angry. She was so insistent on keeping officers out of that room that she had to be physically restrained. At this point, there was nothing in the home to indicate what happened to baby Charlotte. At least, nothing was obvious. So, all of these items were sent off for testing, and in the meantime, Charlotte's body was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that the bottom of Charlotte's feet were dirty, and her fingernails were extremely long for a child of her age. There was also a small abrasion to the right side of her nose. These findings could indicate that maybe Jenea didn't pay the closest attention to Charlotte, forgetting to clip her fingernails. It's possible that the small abrasion to her nose could have been from her scratching herself with her long nails, but other than this, it appears that Charlotte was a healthy weight, she wasn't physically abused or neglected, there was no signs of trauma to the inside or outside of her body, so it appears that she was well cared for. They also found that there was a large amount of a very thick, syrupy liquid in her stomach, which is consistent with the fluid that came out of her mouth while receiving CPR. At first, her cause of death was left as undetermined once the autopsy was complete. But then, the toxicology report came back with very disturbing findings. Turns out, there was an incredibly high dose of fentanyl in Charlotte's system. In fact, the amount of fentanyl in Little Charlotte's system was about a thousand times the fatal dose for an adult. Imagine that amount in a child that is literally not even two years old yet. That is so, so much fentanyl to be found in that small of a body. With that being said, your next question probably would be, where did this baby get the fentanyl? How did it end up in her system? Well, after confiscating that pink sippy cup that Jenea was so hell-bent on officers not taking, it was sent off for testing. And it turned out that there was fentanyl in that sippy cup. So someone put fentanyl in that baby's sippy cup, she drank out of it, and then died as a result of fentanyl poisoning. Knowing all of this information, the medical examiner determined that the fentanyl poisoning was her cause of death and the manner of death was ruled a homicide. Fentanyl doesn't just end up in a baby's sippy cup by accident. Someone had to have put it in that cup with the intention of harming that baby girl. After finding out all of this information, Jenea was taken into the police station for an interview. Once again, Jenea was hostile and defensive. When talking to detectives, she made it clear that Charlotte was in the care of Albert in the hours before her death. When talking to detectives, she made it clear that Charlotte was in the care of Albert in the hours before her death. She said that she was at school when Albert gave her a sippy cup full of a liquid, specifically happy juice from Huggies. She said that she tried giving Charlotte a different juice in another sippy cup earlier, but Charlotte didn't want it. The only juice Charlotte drank that day was the juice that Albert gave her out of that pink sippy cup. She didn't put anything in that sippy cup that day before or after school, and she didn't know exactly what was in it. She completely left it up to Albert. So, that being said, she could not have been the one to put fentanyl in the cup. Did she eat or drink anything? My boyfriend told me he made fish sticks and I want to say like french fries or something. Okay, now, 
That was earlier in the day when you guys got back. Did mm -hmm. she eat or drink anything? No, she didn't eat or drink anything. She had left her, he said she she didn't want her sippy cup before they walked out the door to come and get me. So he left the sippy cup there. Which when sippy she got, cup was that? To my knowledge, it should have been the pink one. The pink sippy cup? Mm -hmm. And where was that located? I'm not even sure. I wasn't there. Did he have that or did she have it? It was left. It was left there. She didn't want it on the way out the door. Okay. When you say on the way out the door, you mean? When they left to come to and get come me from get, school. Okay. When you came back, did she, that pink sippy cup, do you remember where it was? I didn't even see the sippy cup. Did you give her the sippy, sippy cup at all? I didn't see the sippy cup. Okay. Did you put anything in the sippy cup? No, there was a red liquid in it, and I know we had Huggies. Yeah, I remember time. seeing some Huggies in there. To, my, to be more specific, Happy Drink Huggies. Is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. Police asked her about any purchases she made, seeing if she got anything shipped to her internationally, because that could be how she got fentanyl if she ordered it from somewhere like China or Japan but she denied having anything unusual shipped to her. There would be no reason like you would get any packages, say from China or from Japan or anything like that. Like directly from them? Yeah. I don't think so. Okay. But to your knowledge, you... I ordered everything from Walmart. Okay. So just to be clear, the, the, the stuff that was in that sippy cup, you, you did put in or you did not? I did not. Okay. In the interview, they told her that Charlotte was murdered, that this was not an accident. Fentanyl doesn't just get into a sippy cup by accident. It's not like it was left out while the adults were doing it and Charlotte got into it. It's not like Charlotte found it on the streets and decided to eat it and put it in her own sippy cup. It was intentionally placed into her sippy cup and the only two people who could have done it are Albert or her. When told this, she didn't act surprised at all. She wasn't surprised that officers were suggesting that she was murdered. She acted more surprised when the officer suggested that she might have put the drug in the cup than when they told her that her baby was murdered. As the interview went on, she grew more and more defensive, saying that she would never hurt her daughter but she also wasn't trying to figure out what happened. She wasn't asking questions or worried about who could have had access to her daughter and wanted to hurt her. She was very much more concerned with being accused and trying to push the blame away from herself. Well, let me, I'm just gonna cut, I'm just gonna be blunt to you. Your child died from fentanyl poisoning. So why did CYF tell me hypoxic cardiac arrest? They were, there weren't lab results then. So I'm gonna explain this to you, okay? In that sippy cup was fentanyl. In her blood was fentanyl. When they, we just got these results back. It's the same type of fentanyl that people are overdosing every day in Pittsburgh and dying from. Same exact type. Okay. So I need to know how the fentanyl got in the sippy cup. Because right now it's not an accident. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so scientifically, it's impossible for your daughter to put fentanyl in a sippy cup. Okay. Physically, it's impossible for her to. Scientifically, that's another story. But right now, that's, what, that's how she died. It wasn't a heart attack. It wasn't any other reason other than she overdosed on fentanyl. How the fentanyl get in the sippy cup, Janine? Just straight fentanyl? Yeah. So what is it, like a liquid? A, a, a... I'm not a scientist. It comes in a liquid form. It comes in a powder form. I, I'm not exactly sure. But what I am sure of is that that fentanyl was put in a sippy cup and there was liquid mixed into it, and it was given to Charlotte, and that's how she died. So I need to know how that got in there. I have no knowledge to how fentanyl got in my daughter's sippy cup. Okay. Because you realize right now this investigation is taking a whole different turn. Yeah, clearly. And the 
when someone gives someone something and they die from it, it's a homicide. She was poisoned intentionally. Okay, well, okay. I've been making complaints to my rent office because I've been smelling a funny smell in my house uh, several times returning back to my house. This is since you've moved or? No, this is living in apartment number five. This is where you used to live? Yes. Saying. Okay. Well, that still wouldn't explain how it got in the sippy cup. Well, I'm just as clueless as you are. So are you implicating that I put fentanyl in my child's sippy cup? No, I, I, but based on this timeline, I mean, there's only two people that could have put fentanyl in the sippy cup based on what you just told me about 10 minutes ago and based on the whole timeline of that day. I need to know how it got in there because this, this investigation is not going away. Okay, and I'm telling you, I returned to my house from being picked up from school mm -hmm. and I did nothing out of the usual. Do you get fentanyl delivered from China? I have, I know, I don't know anything about fentanyl. Okay. Did you ever put anything in her sippy cup other than huggy mm -hmm. juice? She's drank water. She's drank milk. She's drank Kool-Aid liquids. But have you ever put anything in there? No, I have not. Okay. Other than... I mean, because some parents will give their kids a little bit of, you know, Benadryl or something like that. So like, no, that doesn't go in a sippy cup because it's supposed to be measured out and Benadryl's not supposed to be drank. Tylenol's not supposed to be drank over specific amount of hours. It's supposed to be one dose and that's it. Right. I agree with you. I agree with you. But people, parents... I'm not one of those people okay. or parents. Okay. That's what I'm asking. The amount of fentanyl that was in her system was extremely high. Okay, it was, it, it was very high. And that's essentially when she drank the sippy cup, whenever she picked that sippy cup off the bed, it was absorbed very quickly. And once she swallowed it, she didn't have much time to survive. Am I under arrest? No. Are there any more questions? I just want to know how it got in there. That's, that's the big question. I don't know how it got in there. This is news to me like it's news to you. If you had to guess how it got in there. A manufacturing issue with the happy drinks. So you think it could have been the, the huggy? Yes. And as a matter of fact, I took a sip of those huggies and I actually, it didn't really have a, a pleasing taste to it. We tested the huggies. Mm. No fentanyl. So what are you implying? Well, it's my job to find out how this got in there, okay, at this point. And then, like, right, this isn't going to go away. This investigation is not going away until I find out. Okay. When you find out, you let me know. I definitely will. I Any definitely will. Any further questions? I think someone, just like a bartender, mixes up a drink, put it in that sippy cup. That's the only possible way it could have got in there. Is there any more questions, officer, detective? Do you agree with me? I'm not agreeing because I, um, who would do that to a child? That's I. I, I, re no I really, really, really messed up person. Been. Really messed up person would do that. There's no possible way. In my opinion, in the interview. Jenea was very cold and unemotional. She isn't surprised that somebody intentionally murdered her daughter. She doesn't try to ask any questions or suggest any other possible scenarios for what could have happened. All she said was that there was no way that she could have done this. Of course, with so many of these cases where we see parents being interviewed, we can say that we can't judge how someone responds to trauma when their own child dies such a tragic death. However, as you could all see, she is not acting like someone whose child was just murdered. She was not acting like this was a shock to her. She was not acting like someone who was just told the worst news of her entire life. She 
only cared about pushing the blame away from herself rather than worrying about her daughter's murder. At this point with the whole timeline, I want to point out that Jenea said that Albert gave her the juice before they picked her up from school. She may or may not have drank any, but by the time Jenea got home, she still didn't see her drink it. She then laid her down for her nap with her sippy cup, and it was then that Charlotte died. With that being said, once ingested, fentanyl will start taking effect very quickly. As I mentioned earlier, according to both Albert and Jenea, the juice was given to Charlotte at noon. Jenea wasn't back home until about 2 p.m. If she had drank the fentanyl when she was first given the sippy cup, the effects would have started much sooner and she probably would have died in Albert's care. I will mention that Jenea tried to make it a point to say like, oh, she didn't drink it right away when Albert first gave her the sippy cup. She didn't take any until I got home, but none of us saw her drink any of it. I don't believe that for one second. With that being said, I don't think that that's what happened at all. It wasn't until after Albert left that Charlotte apparently drank the juice, which was laced with fentanyl. We know that because again, she didn't die until she went down for the nap. Again, Albert was not present when she took the nap. If Albert truly was the one who put fentanyl in the cup, it makes sense that she would have died before they went to pick Jenea up from school. He would have given it to her, put her down for a nap, and then acted surprised when it was time to pick Jenea up. I doubt he would have put her in that car and took her with him if he knew she was about to die. I also don't believe that when a child is given a sippy cup that they're not just going to sip it right away. Even if they don't like what's in it, they're probably going to try it first because they can't see what's inside. So they're at least going to take a little sip when you give them the cup initially and then if they don't like it, they just won't drink any more. But I do not believe for a second that she didn't drink any of her juice when Albert gave it to her. All of this makes so much more sense sense that after Albert left, Jenea put fentanyl in that cup and then laid her down for a nap knowing what would happen. I don't think Albert knew about any of this at all. In my opinion, I think that Jenea had everything to do with this, again, specifically waiting for Albert to leave before killing Charlotte with Albert being none the wiser. Otherwise, the only other way this could have gone, in my opinion, is if they were both in on it. But, if that were the case, I don't see why Jenea would have let Albert leave knowing that they were both about to kill Charlotte. That gives him an alibi and makes it so he wouldn't be there when her body is found. If they were both in on it and clearly Jenea doesn't want to take the fall, why would she let Albert off the hook? She clearly is trying to pin this on him during that first interview, so if they were in on it together, I feel like she'd make this story a lot more believable and wouldn't have let him leave after they gave her the fentanyl. The reason she did it after he left, in my opinion, is because she didn't want him to know what she was doing. But that's just my opinion. What do you guys think? Either way, based on the evidence they found up to this point, police strongly believed that Jenea was the one who murdered her own baby girl, so she was arrested on charges of first-degree murder. While in jail awaiting her trial, according to the other inmates in the jail, Jenea talked a lot about her case. She told multiple other inmates that she didn't kill Charlotte. She also said she didn't mean to kill Charlotte. She said that she didn't die while Albert was caring for her, so he couldn't have been responsible. Then, in one of the most disturbing statements, she told one inmate, I didn't want a damn girl anyways. If that doesn't scream guilty, I don't know what else does. By May 28th, 2019, a little over a year after the death of 18-month-old Charlotte, Jenea's trial for murder started. The prosecution argued that Jenea murdered her baby daughter because Charlotte was getting in the way of Jenea's lifestyle. Jenea wanted to relax and smoke weed all of the time, and having a daughter gets in the way of that. So, she murdered her daughter so she didn't have the responsibility of caring for her so that she could spend more time to herself. The prosecution argued that there is no way that anybody else could have put the drug into her juice. Albert had absolutely no motive to hurt Charlotte, a child that is not his and whom he has no obligation to care for. 
if he didn't want Charlotte around, he could have just left the relationship altogether. But even beyond the lack of motive, as we discussed earlier, the prosecution also said that it wasn't even possible for Albert to have been the one to drug her. If he was, she would have died almost immediately, long before Jenea even got home. And then if somehow Albert did it after picking up Jenea from school before he left, there was only a few minutes where he was even around, so there's a good chance she would have seen him slipping something into her sippy cup and would have been like, hey, what did you just do? So again, there's really no way Albert could have been the one who did this. So the only person who could possibly be responsible is Jenea. This was not an accident. There was enough fentanyl in that baby's cup to kill a horse. That is an intentional homicide. On the other hand, the defense continued to try and place the blame on Albert, arguing that Jenea would never want to hurt her daughter. Jenea was working. She was in college to improve herself, and she did her best to care for Charlotte. She was not the one who put fentanyl in her daughter's sippy cup. After a week of trial and hearing arguments from both sides, the jury went in for deliberations, and after deliberating, they actually decided that charges of both first or third degree murder weren't appropriate in this case. Instead, they found that Jenea Pratt was guilty of involuntary manslaughter. I haven't been able to find really anywhere how they came to that conclusion. My guess is they couldn't say for sure whether she intentionally killed her child with the fentanyl. I will note that throughout this whole thing, we've been saying that she had enough fentanyl in her system to kill a horse or a thousand times the lethal dose for an adult. But even that is a very, very small amount. It does not take much fentanyl at all to kill somebody. So that's how overdoses happen so often. That is why it is such a huge problem in the country right now because people will take such a small amount not knowing how potent it is and still have it be way, way too much. It's not like they poured an entire gallon of fentanyl into this baby's sippy cup to get her to overdose on it. It really does take a very tiny amount. That being said, I could see how a jury would think that maybe Jenea just wanted Charlotte to sleep without actually intending on killing her. Yes, she drugged her and that isn't okay, so she should be held responsible for that, but you can't say for sure whether she actually meant to kill her. I'm not saying that's how I feel in the slightest, but I could see that being an argument in the jury room. The other argument they could have made is that maybe Albert was the one who put fentanyl in it and it just so happened that Charlotte didn't take any sips until after Albert left and so it just so happened that he wasn't there when she died. I guess I could also see that being an argument. Either way, at her sentencing hearing, the judge expressed just how disgusted she is with Jenea. In her remarks, she stated, quote, I am considering the violation of trust that you held towards your daughter. Charlotte is essentially just a forgotten victim here, but she looked to you and only you as her source of safety and protection and support. She said that any remorse Jenea has shown is, quote, nothing more than a box to be checked on your list of things to do when you show up at a sentencing. I find you to be a callous, cold-hearted, and remorseless person. With that being said, the judge issued 24-year-old Jenea Pratt a sentence of 5 to 10 years behind bars which to me, and I'm sure most of you will agree, is not nearly, nearly enough. In my opinion, I do think she intentionally killed her daughter. I think she probably was just tired of being a mother and somehow obtained the fentanyl and decided that she was just going to get rid of her, thus allowing her to live the carefree, relaxed life she wanted. I don't think anybody would give a child fentanyl with any purpose other than murder. If she just wanted to put Charlotte to sleep and make sure she stayed asleep for a couple hours, you can literally use Benadryl, cough syrup, or over-the-counter sleep aids. Literally so many other things other than fentanyl. You have to jump through so many hoops to get your hands on fentanyl and then administer it to a child versus you could just go to the store and get an over-the-counter sleep aid if you really just want her to go to sleep. I am not condoning drugging your child to put them to sleep in any way, shape, or form. I think it's wrong. You should not be doing that. But if you're going to, you're not going to use fentanyl. So in my opinion, this was 100% an intentional murder. 
Again, I understand how the jury came to their decision, but I do not agree with it in the slightest. It's very disturbing to know that regardless of if Jenea serves five or 10 years, she will be out in her 20s or 30s. And that to me is just so, so unethical. Fair. It is unfair to her child that no longer gets to live a life because Jenea was simply tired of being a mother. Even though Jenea was given an incredibly light sentence given the crime, she still appealed her sentence saying it was too harsh, which is absolutely absurd and continues to show that Jenea does not care about anybody but herself. Five to ten years for the death of your child is literally less than a slap on the freaking wrist. Thankfully, her appeal was denied, so she'll at least be spending half a decade behind bars for her crime, but that is not nearly enough for the horrific crime that she has committed. But that is all of the information I have on today's case. You all heard my opinion that this was 100% an intentional murder and Jenea didn't get the right conviction, but after hearing all of the details, I'm so curious to hear what all of you think. Do you think this was an intentional murder? Do you think Albert could have had something to do with it? Do you agree with the jury's findings? If so, why? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any other case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.